Good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic morning. It is Monday. Monday is a great day. I have a very, very full day today. Being a, um, a book editor, Modern Poker Theory has um, finally been all turned into me in the form of about 550 pages <laughs> of documents. And I've already been through most of it but I have to get through another 20 or 30 pages today. And um, we'll make it happen. It's been a big project. It's taken way longer than I thought. Turns out most book projects take way longer than I thought, unless, unless, I am the only one who has to touch it. If I'm the only one who has to touch it, the book can be done in two weeks. If anybody else has to touch it, we're looking at a multi-year project. You know, funny enough, um, this book here, Selling a No Limit Hold'em, I had this genius idea. Actually, my one of my um, team members, Dan Stanley, had this idea. Thank you, Dan. To get a book made with lots of other people. And I thought, okay, well, I'll have everyone write 25 pages or so on the topic of their choosing. That should be easy enough, right? They'll be able to do that in, what, a week, two weeks? So um, some of them got the work done in about two weeks. Ed Miller did. He has a lot of books. Alex Fitzgerald did. He's had two books since the release of this book. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But some of these other people, um, they took years, multiple, a year and a half, give or take. I'm not sure why. I think it's because it's difficult for them, right? And you learn. So anyway, I thought this book would take me literally one month. Talk about my naivete. <laughs> and um, turns out it took about two years. But that's how it goes. Oh goodness. This book, on the other hand, same size. 500 pages, took um, a month. Big, big book, lots of images. But notice, only Jonathan Little. Only took a month. It's funny how that works, right? Oh, get in there, book. All right. Today we had a question from someone on Twitter. I forget who, sorry. They wanted me to discuss finding value at the World Series of Poker. But um, we're not going to make this only about the World Series of Poker. We're going to make it about everything. All right, so what does finding value mean? First things first, what are your options, right? Let's say you are good at cash games and tournaments and sit and goes and anything else, right? Let's just assume you're great. Well, if you're just great, then you should do whatever makes you the highest hourly rate, right? Well, maybe, not necessarily. Um, first things first, most of you are probably not equally good at tournaments, cash games, sit and goes, etc. At the World Series of Poker, there are all sorts of tournaments available to you. I think the person who asked the question, maybe it was Troy here, um, I think they were trying to tell me to, or trying to get me to say, oh, play tournaments at, um, Orleans or something like that, where you find maybe a tournament that has low rake against soft players, etc., etc. But I don't really know about any of those things because I'm not playing those events. I think the... Very high buy-in tournaments provide for me the best hourly rate, right? Because that really is what I care about. Um, but for most people, that's not going to be the case. So what does value mean in terms of poker? I mean, Troy, if you're here, if you're the one who asked this, let me know. What does value mean? Are you saying which tournaments will give you the highest return on investment? Well, that's not necessarily the ideal tournament to play. For example, at the World Series of Poker, they have this tournament called the Marathon. I made the mistake of playing it the first year. I say it's a mistake. It wasn't really a mistake. But... um. It's something like a five-day long tournament. And what happens in a five-day long tournament? Well, you'll have a high return on investment, but let's say you're really good and you have 100% return on investment. Well, that means you're making $2,500 in three days on average. $2,500 divided by three days on average is what? 700 something a day? 800, 800 a day? And could I have done better doing something else? And the answer is probably yes because the World Series of Poker is a very profitable time. I could have sat there and played five to no limit during the dead time and made more money than that, right? And therefore, that is not a good value, assuming I care about winning money, right? But a lot of people don't really care about winning money. They care about having a good experience. So it's important to understand that not only how much can you win, but how, how, what you enjoy is very valuable. For example, if you know you get to go play one tournament at the World Series of Poker, only one, well, that means, well, first things first, are you good or are you bad? 
right? If you're bad, you want to play the most turbo game you can possibly play because that makes all win rates get closer to zero, right? If you're playing a... If you think you have a big edge, you'd much prefer a slow tournament. Again, assuming you only can play one tournament. Personally, I would much rather play three one-day tournaments for $2,500 each with 50% ROI than one super slow tournament with 100% ROI, right? Because on one, you make 3750 and on the other one, you make 2500 So would you rather make 2500 or 3750 with less variance because you get to play more games, right? Volume does cure variance, and you'd much rather play a lot of tournaments with a low ROI than a few tournaments with a big ROI, at least in my opinion, because um, you're going to have a higher hourly rate a lot of the time. Um, so you're saying which tournaments have the best structure. I mean, but again, what does the best structure even mean? You have to understand if a tournament ends in one day, say it takes 12 hours, the structure is essentially the same. It's not that big of a deal. I'm sure there are some differences. I'm sure there are some things like some have better early structures, some have better late structures. Um, in my mind, it kind of all evens out across the board. I am sure you can find events where maybe you have like 50% ROI in a 12-hour tournament compared to 40% ROI in a different 12-hour tournament. Um, but it's just, like, it's just not worth spending my time thinking about this. So, Troy, what, is, what does a value mean to you? Maybe we'll, we'll discuss specifically to you. If you want a good structure, just find ones that give you a bunch of chips and the blinds go up slowly. Problem though is that those take multiple days. As they take multiple days, your hourly rate goes into the toilet. Mark uh, agrees. If you want a good structure, you generally want lots of chips with slow blind increases. So, for example, I used to do very well when they had these really slow World Poker Tour events. I crushed it. And a lot of the best players did crush it back then because you were never really put at risk. I mean, if you look at all my big scores, they were all in six-day tournaments or five-day tournaments where you had a long time to extract value. And because the buy-in was very high, $10,000 or more, it was worth it, right? And also those are very odd events because they sideline in a lot of players and they don't come up all that often, right? So those, in my mind, were a great value because you could, essentially, essentially like a deep stack cash game the whole time. Um, didn't I say the World Series daily deep stacks have too much rate for them to be profitable? Too much rake for them to be highly profitable. You can certainly be profitable in them, but almost certainly too much rake to have more than like 30% ROI. Um, does, is the big 50 a good deal with no rake? Again, Anthony, what does good deal mean? Think about this, right? Does the rake actually matter? Think about it. Let's presume in the big 50, you're going to have 100% ROI. Okay? What if they raked at 10%, now you're going to have 90% ROI? Does it really matter all that much? It's like, yeah, it matters some, but it's not the end of the world, right? Now, if the structure is awful and you would have a normally a 10% ROI, then they rate 10%, now you're at break even, then it's very, very detrimental. So if the game is soft, the rate doesn't really matter a ton. It, it does matter, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't matter a ton. Um, tips for playing your second World Series event, just play the best you possibly can. Don't worry about surviving. You say you lasted only six hours. Don't worry about surviving. Surviving is irrelevant. Just go in there and play your absolute best. So anyway, is it a value because there's no rake? Yeah, of course it's a value in the, in the theory of normally there is rake, now there's none, right? But if you're still a bad player, yeah, you're still going to lose. Um, obviously, you'd rather play games with no rake than games with rake, right? But I don't think that should be a gigantic determining factor. Like for me, I'm going to be at the World Series when that event is going on, but I'm not going to go play it. Why? Because there are many other things I could be doing that would give me a much higher hourly rate. But am I concerned with saving $50 on rake? Like, no, I don't care about saving $50 on rake. I care about having a high return on investment. Now, I understand that for a lot of you, $500 is a relatively big buy-in, and that's, that's fine. And if that is one of the higher buy-ins you were playing, then you should probably be playing that event. Um, that said, there's tons of variance, tons, tons, tons of variance, and um, that's a okay, right? You have to know what you sign up for. Let's see. Your local city game, 10% match rake up to $20. Ooh, that's hard. How do you beat that game? Play really, really nitty. The way you beat games with high rake is to play really, really nitty. Cash games, I mean. Once you pay the tournament rake, it, it doesn't make a difference. Then you just play the best you can. 
Played a tournament, blinds went up quickly, felt like bingo. People, people who say poker is bingo don't understand how to play short stack poker. There we go. We said it. If you, can, if you feel like short stack poker is all luck, you don't know how to play short stack very well because people make blunders on a regular basis. I'm, I'm not even that, I mean, I feel like I'm really good at it, but I still make mistakes. It's hard to play great short stack poker. And the neat thing about short stack poker is that if you make a mistake, it's often for like one big blind or half a big blind, but you have to realize half a big blind is 10% of a stack, which often ends up being four starting sacks or something insane. Do you imagine making a mistake that costs you four starting sacks? It's like, it's brutal. Um, poker, I'm not exactly sure what you're saying. Um, using heads up display definitely can't explain to you how to play well. Mark, I'm very confident you can have the strong mindset. Could you describe, describe your single table satellite strategy? Play it like a cash game. Just understand, most cash games aren't played shallow stack. You have to under, understand how to play good shallow stack poker. All right, so what are your options? Quite often, you're going to be way better at one game than another. Cash, multi-table tournaments, sit and goes, etc. cetera. Um, Pot Limit Omaha, Seven Card Stud, Mixed Games, whatever. Most of you are significantly better at one form of poker than the other. Than the other. So play the one that you are really good at, right? That makes logical sense because you're going to be a winner in that. Um, next, should you travel or stay home? If I did not have much of a bankroll, you can be very confident. I would be parked in Los Angeles or in Fort Lauderdale, Miami, that area, during the World Series of Poker. Because all the best players from those areas that are well-populated and very soft, they all go to Vegas. So you're left with an area, two areas with tons and tons of poker that don't have as many good players in it. Right? So... Don't, don't travel. Realize you don't have to travel. Quite often, you'll make way more money not traveling, especially if everybody else is busy traveling. So keep that in mind, right? But again, a lot of you want experiences. You're valuing experiences over money, and that's okay. But realize you're giving up equity in exchange for that. Um, how much time do you have to devote to playing and to studying, right? If you can only go for a weekend, and it's going to take you two days to get to and from Vegas, you end, up, you end up spending three days to play one tournament, which doesn't make sense. You could stay home and play two or three or four tournaments, right? So quite often, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. What about how much time do you have to devote to studying? Well, if you don't have a whole lot of time to, devoted to studying, you probably shouldn't be going and playing big buy-in tournaments, again, assuming you care about the money. So you need to make sure that you spend a lot of time studying before you go. And if you don't do that, you are leaving a ton of money on the table. Let's see... Am I tagging you in a tournament? No, absolutely not. I just told you I'm not going to play a $500 tournament. If I'm not playing a $500 tournament, I'm not playing a 1K divided by 4 or 3 or 2 tournament. Only people I will play with are my parents. We, find, we played it one time together, we final tabled it. <laughs> and I did almost none of the playing. Jason Matt asked the question that I think is a bad question. Which is a better value, the big 50, the millionaire maker, or the win tournaments? What, is, what does a value mean, right? You haven't determined this. You have to determine this for yourself. First off, Millionaire Maker is 1500 buy-in. What if you aren't bankrolled for that? Probably shouldn't play it. Having a smaller field, how does that make it more of a value or less of a value? Right? It doesn't matter. What matters is what are you trying to accomplish? Let's see. You mean a heads-up display where it tells you what to do against an opponent from their past decisions? I mean, look. You can definitely have stats on your opponent. They're very valuable. I mean, that's what good players do in live poker, right? You know what your opponents have done in the past. I mean, in the past, data mining was much more of a thing. You could buy 10 million hand histories, import them into your heads up, into your holder manager, and then you just have stats on everyone. But it doesn't tell you what to do. You have to figure that out for yourself. And if you do blindly follow it, you're probably leaving money on the table. Final table hand question. It's not what we're discussing today, but we will try. Seven left, already in the money. You're third in chips. You have ace jack playing. What, 16 big blinds deep. Pulse a small blind, you raise the three big blinds. I would definitely limp or open jam. Either two, either one, probably open jam. If you limp and they jam, easy call. When you limp, you're certainly not planning on folding. All right, next. We already discussed this, where we have the highest hourly rate, right? If you'll have a high hourly rate in, let's say for me, I know that I want a ton playing single table satellites in the World Series, and I have a very good hourly rate there. So... I am looking to 
play those if I'm trying to maximize hourly rate because I'm pretty sure we can get something like $300 hourly rate, give or take. So that's, that's pretty solid, right? With almost no variance. So if you can play these games with almost no variance, with a high hourly rate, why wouldn't you, right? Um, also, they're convenient. They're right at the Rio. You bust the tournament, you walk right there. There's no travel time. Imagine you had to go to Bellagio or Aria or somewhere and wait in line for an hour to get into a cash game. Well, there's an hour burned right there, right? Say you can only play for four hours because you have to go to bed and play tournaments the next day. Well, you certainly don't want to spend an hour of that waiting, right? So you have to ask, like, what gives us the highest hourly rate, including all the travel time, all of the waiting time, all of the um, bonus rank, like maybe it's super expensive to eat at a particular venue or something like that, or maybe you have to pay for valet parking, whatever it is. Um, all of that should be accounted for. Next, what do you enjoy? Maybe you just like playing Pot Limit Omaha, like having a lot of variants. Maybe you hate variants and you want to play a really nitty type game, like Omaha 8 or better, where you just play good cards, right? I mean, you need to find what you enjoy and do that as well, because, I mean, I knew a long time ago, whenever I was playing either 1020 or 510 at Bellagio, I had a slightly higher, higher hourly rate at 1020, but variance was through the roof. So would I rather have variance through the roof and have almost the same win rate, or would I rather keep variance low? Well, I was happy just to sit there and keep variance low and make almost the same amount of money. I had no problem with that. When I say almost the same amount, I would have made like 15 or 20% more um, taking the super high variance route where you have 100k swings or I could take the low variance route, make 20% less and have 15k swings. So it's just like way nicer. <laughs> you go there, you show up, you make your money and go home. It's like the easiest thing. Um, but you'd much rather have that than knowing you're just going to go on huge upswings and huge downswings, at least in my mind, because that's what most professionals want. They want to have a good win rate and low variance. Um, speaking of variance, how much variance will you accept? right? A lot of people, I mean, listen, anyone out there who complains about bad beats hates variance. So you want to play low variance games, low, 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 low variance games. Um, that means not tournaments. That means soft cash games. That's where you're going to have a very low variance. So definitely keep that in mind. <laughs> Doctor says, this is boring. I'm unfollowing you. Okay, bye. <laughs> I am certainly not for everyone. Most people do not like education. And that is A-OK -okay with me, because that is why all of you succeed and why lots of other people don't. Just tuned in. Have we talked about um, a shootout yet? No, I didn't know, why we, I didn't know we were talking about shootouts yet. What do you think about mathematics of poker? I thought it was irrelevant for almost everyone. Jason, thanks for wearing the patch at running up Reno. You played eight tournaments, cashed in four, and final tabled three. You also played against... Poker, pro vlogger, streamer Brad Owen, Andrew Nimi, Jason Somerville, Kevin Martin. Awesome. You owe a lot to poker coaching. I'm glad that it helped. All right. Is there a better way to use my training videos than passively watching? You should never be passively watching. Uh, most of my videos are made so that you can pause and think ahead. At least the hand history reviews are. You can pause. You can think ahead. You can try to figure out what I or the student would do and then move forward, right? Don't just sit there and have a beer and, and watch them. You need to actually be studying. You need to be taking notes. You need to be figuring out things that are kind of like aha moments and write them down so that you can make sure you um, discuss, you review them later. Troy says you are leaning towards playing this mainly by structure over preference. Structure doesn't actually matter that much, Troy. All the tournaments take almost the same amount of time. I say almost all. Not all, of course. Usually, um, the main event of the day will have a way better structure, right? Two-day, three-day, four-day, five-day tournaments have better structures which lead to higher return on investments, but maybe lower ROI. So don't just think, oh, this one has a slightly better structure than this one, therefore I should play it. Quite often, the better structure tournaments have higher rake. Why? Because they take longer, right? And that kind of thing is relevant. Have you heard anything about crushing World Series satellites? I have a video. I just, I, I just, it was part of my World Series bundle. I think that just expired. Maybe it didn't. Go to pokercoaching.com slash WSOP bundle. Why are the structures irrelevant? They're irrelevant because, well, first off, if some structures are obviously horrible, some are obviously good, right? But all the tournaments that take 12 hours on average are gonna have roughly the same structure. Like we discussed, maybe you'll have a little bit more um, variance in one, maybe you'll have a little bit less variance in the other, 
But if your ROI is, let's say, 50% in one, it's gonna be between like 40 and 60 in the other. It's not gonna be 50% in one and 200% in the other. What really matters is player pool composition. That is way more important than structure. Why is mathematics and poker by Bill Chen irrelevant? Ask yourself how often you actually need to know this math at the table. And the answer is you don't. Next, do you need to know this math away from the table? You don't because they're solvers. Solvers use a lot of the math they discuss, but it is, um, listen, I don't know Bill Chen or the other guy, I think his name's Ackerman, but I feel like that was a book written by academics for academics to try to make themselves seem smart. Now, the stuff in there is useful. I enjoyed the book. I enjoy very difficult poker books, but if you ask how many times I'm running calculus, literal calculus at the poker table, the answer is never. I'm not running calculus at the table. Um, DP makes it uh, makes a good point. Keep it simple, stupid. And that is that is right if you're actually trying to help a large number of people. Um, it certainly is a, a useful book if you want to be developing programs to solve poker. Problem is that's already been done. Um, another difficult book that I really enjoy is called Expert Heads Up No Limit Hold'em. I like that book a lot, but it's a hard book. If you ask a lot of the best players in the world, what's their favorite poker book? It's that one. But it's certainly not for everyone, and that's A-OK. -okay. The book I'm working on now, Modern Poker Theory. I view that as like mathematics of poker, but useful and applicable. In my opinion, educational products should be useful and applicable. And that is what I always strive to do. And that's why all of you like me, because I've actually helped you better your poker game and hopefully your life, right? If I was just talking nonsense that, well, not even nonsense, perfect sense, but in a way that no one could understand, you wouldn't like me all that much because I wouldn't actually be helping you. I'd be making myself sound smart, but I don't care about sound, sounding smart. I care about helping people. How'd you learn to write your books? Did you work with a ghostwriter? Never worked with a ghostwriter. I have helped others with their books, almost acting as a ghostwriter. I only have 14 books in my name, but a few others that um, I've helped with, helped significantly with. I mean, Modern Poker Theory is a good example of this. It's not my um, material. I didn't make the material. Michael Acevedo did all that, but I helped put it in a presentable form, right? So how did I learn to write books? I would make a big outline. Start very easy. Pre-flop, flop, turn, river, other stuff. Okay, fill in the blanks. Pre-flop, what do you need? Figure it out, right? You need when you're first to raise, when they're limpers, when there's a raise in front of you, when there's a raise in three bet, when you raise someone three bets, now you can four bet, etc. Go through all that, outline that. On the flop, how do you break that down? Break that down, turn, river, etc. Other topics, we have mindset issues, we have money issues, we have all sorts of issues, right? And once you do that, they just fill in the blanks. That's how I write essentially all of my books. Every single one of them, I start with a big outline. Outlining will take a while. And then I write as much as I want to write about each, each point. Each, there, may, there may be, I don't know, 500 points in a book. But no, I've never worked with a ghostwriter. I just write like I would like to read. <laughs> All right. New member of Poker Coaching. Welcome. Mentioned before, I said, don't play the Big 50. I did not say that. What do I think of the starting structure? I think it's perfectly fine. I did not say don't play it. I said it may not be the best use of time. When will it be released? It should be at the World Series of Poker in the middle of it. Is Heads Up, Expert Heads Up No Limit Holder by Will Tipton, not Will Upton. Will Tipton, is that what I was referring to? Yes, there are two volumes. But it's not for everyone. Most people who, who buy it, it will be way over their heads. And that's okay. It's a hard book. Do you have a package deal where you can buy hard copies of all of my books? I do not. It's a good idea, though. Um, message dbpoker1 on Instagram, they, or on Twitter, or go to their website, dnbpoker.com. They may be able to help you. Also, I don't know if you all know this, but I, I um, ma manage a magazine there. Go to dmbpoker.com slash magazine. I just typed it in the chat. Um, we post something like between four and eight articles each month. So check it out. Uh, what's an adequate study to play ratio? Depends on your scenario, Matt. All right, some people are very, already very, very good at poker. They don't need to study quite as much. Some people are really, really bad at poker. They need to study a ton, right? As you get better and better, ideally you can study less and less, but even then you still need to make sure that you are always studying some. 
PJ says, I said you're not going to play it, not that you said don't play it. Okay, good. Well, yes, I definitely say that it is a good thing for most people, but it's not a good thing for me because we have better uses of my time. I would rather sit at the DMB poker booth and just talk to people because I think interacting with people, making people happy, giving them good experience is worth way more than the $500 in return on investment I would make. How do you choose the right cash game? Find the games that are fun. Troy, send us an email at support at pokercoaching.com and we'll see what we can do. What tournaments would you say to start playing for someone who just started? Play small stakes events. Play small, small stakes games where the money you lose is irrelevant because you don't need to lose money if you don't know what you're doing. Also, put $50 in an online site. Play $1 buy-in tournaments, right? You just want to get experience. Listen, everyone who's saying, asking how much time should you spend studying and whatnot, it depends a lot on what you're trying to accomplish and what you're trying to do in life, right? If you have a job, well, first off, you can't do it eight hours a day. There's only a few hours of the day left, right? So, um, in general, I study whenever I can, which is, is a decent amount of the time. How do I study now? A lot of what I do involves consuming the content of the Pokar Backing Company. They have videos and content and presentations by many of the best players in the world. And I take a lot of that, condense it, and give it all to you. Make it practical and applicable, right? I'm a filter, essentially. I'm a filter and a condenser. I certainly am not a poker genius, but I understand it pretty well. And I can take these complex ideas that are being taught to the best players in the world and present them to all of you. So anyway, that's how I am studying for the most part. Also, I outsource a lot of solver work to people. I have people transcribe the high roller tournaments for me. I go through those and look at all those spots, try to find stuff that they're doing that I'm not. Um, I go through the card face up final tables on YouTube with no commentary. We don't need commentary. We need those so we can see what the best players are doing, et cetera, et cetera. All right. You see the heads up, limit, hold them, and solved. And flooring is solved. Do you think there'll be a book on playing Optimal Limit Heads Up? No, the game's dead. Dead games don't have books written about them. Did I use an editor to trim down or type my text? No. I would say my, I will say that my first book is, is definitely the worst written of the bunch. Um, I'm in the process of going back through it, and I cleaned it up a little bit, but really it was, it was pretty good. Um, I just try to not add fluff, right? Listen, in my day-to-day -day life, I don't have much fluff. My wife says sometimes I come off a little bit too abrupt. And those are the breaks, I guess. Um, I, I just try to, I, I'm not trying to, again, I'm not trying to sound smart or write a big book. I'm trying to write the minimum possible to get the point across thoroughly. How do you recommend small six players play? Figure out what your opponents do wrong and adjust to, to death. You read the Harrington books. Okay, so you're probably way too tight. Are there any books that you should get? Mastering Small Stakes, No Limit Hold'em at jlpoker.com slash mastering. Here, I'll type that in right here. Poker.com. Pokercoaching.com slash WSOP is where you can get into that um, giveaway. I believe that we are going to be giving away those three seats to the Big 50. Everyone who wants to get in the Big 50, get in for free. You might as well enter my giveaway. We will be drawing the winner to that, I believe, tomorrow. So, yeah. For everyone on Instagram, when I type things, you can't see them. Yes, because believe it or not, we're doing this on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Periscope. Five things. Instagram, they're funny. They, they won't let me stream to all of them. So, if you're on Instagram, you're missing almost all the chat. You're missing almost all of the, well, all of my typing. So, Sorry. We have two cameras here. Let's see if I can do this. Let's see. We actually have two cameras here. Can you all see each other? Hello. Hello. Oh, how do we do it? Hello. Hello. There's the setup. You both just got to see the other half of the world. Okay. All right. Anyway, that's that. Let's see. What else? Where are we going? What are we doing? How do you get over a downswing? Play a lot more. Should you give it a break or holiday and study more? Yes. Listen, volume cures variance, okay? 
at the end of the day, you need to play a lot of poker. If you have an edge, if you have an edge, you will win money. If you don't have an edge, you will lose money. The thing is, there's a lot of people who think there's, everyone thinks they're supposed to win. And they're not going to win because poker's hard. And you have to be very realistic, right? If you're bad, your downswings are going to be way worse than if you're good. Because if you're good, your downswings will be like break even. If you are bad, your downswings are going to be atrocious. Is the chat in Twitch? Yes, there's chats on Twitch, YouTube, etc. If you go on, if you go to twitch.tv slash Jonathan Little or youtube.com slash flow the turn, you will see the chat there. All right. Wesley says you're excited for the big 50 drawing. You're happy for the opportunity. Yeah, I'm glad you all are enjoying it. We will be, we're going to be giving away a lot of stuff. I mean, I've already given away a $1,500 mid-stakes poker tour seat, a $1,000 seat to something else. We've given away a lot of stuff in terms of tournament buy-ins. And um, I'm happy to do it. You all give to me. I'm happy to give back. All right, next. And finally... In terms of finding value, what do you want? That's what you really have to figure out. A lot of people don't know what they want. A lot of people kind of aimlessly going about, not really understanding the purpose of what they are doing. So what do you want? What are you trying to accomplish? I think most people would be way better off approaching poker from the I want to have fun point of view than the I want to make as much money as I can point of view. Because... Quite often, if you really go hardcore and try to be the best poker player you can be, but you can only devote an hour a day to it, it's going to be hard to get very good. It just is. So whenever you're playing, if you're sitting there very stoic and wearing sunglasses and a hoodie and not having a good time and just trying your best to make good decisions, you'll probably have a way better time throwing a party, <laughs> right? And I think it's important to understand what your actual goals are. And I realize poker is a hobby for most of you, which is why you need to make sure you're actually having fun. If you go to the casino and you come home pissed every time you lose, you didn't do it right. You're supposed to be having a good time. When you enjoy what you do, you excel. Yeah, pretty much. Any thoughts on a book for small stakes poker? Oh, on the book? Yeah, I don't know anything about that book. I have a book, Strategies for Beating Small Stakes Poker, Tournaments or Cash Games, and also Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. I do not recommend any other books on small stakes poker. That video on plugging the OLI call leak. I mean, I don't know. Probably. Go to youtube.com slash float the turn. We have lots and lots and lots of videos. We've only been doing this for 15 years, so I've probably done something about that at some point. So yeah. So what do you really want? And how do you achieve it? First things first, do you want something that is actually not achievable, right? For example, a lot of people want a World Series of Poker bracelet. I don't have any, and I don't really care if I get any. And that may sound crazy to some people, but I realize I have literally no control over if I get one or not. Beyond, the one thing I do have, two things I have control over. I can study more, and I can play more World Series events. So, do I care enough to learn the mixed games at a high proficiency? No, I don't. I realize that takes a huge amount of time and I don't have a huge amount of time. Fine. Next, do I want to go play as many World Series events as I possibly can? In the past, the answer is yes. Now, the answer is definitely not. Why? Because I have better uses of my time. Now, we can um, write a poker article and give it to you. We can do a little coffee. We can make pokercoaching.com, right? I can do things like that to provide significant value to all of you because it's not all about me at this point. I've already done well enough. I'm trying to help all of you now, right? So this World Series, I'm gonna be out there for two weeks at the beginning and I'm not even playing very many ser tournament World Series events at the beginning. I'm playing only, I think, a 5K, a 10K, and a 1K Turbo. Um, but then I'm also playing the World Poker Tour 10K at Aria and a 15,000 Tournament of Champions at Aria. So that's the first trip. It's not even really a World Series trip. And then the Next time, I will be playing a lot of World Series events, but even then, I'm not playing every 1,500 or every 1,000 because it's just not that important to me. And that's okay. So I understand that, right? 
But so many of you all out there say you want to win a bracelet or a circuit ring or something like that, but then you don't play every bracelet or circuit ring that, event that you possibly can, which implies you don't actually care. So why are you striving to get something that you don't actually care about? Because if you go through your life being sad or depressed that you don't have the bracelet or the ring or whatever, but you're not actually doing the right thing to get it, like what are you doing? What's the purpose? And you need to be happy in your life. And having things you're going to find does not make you happy. Imagine you do get that bracelet. Well, what then? You think you're just going to stop? No, you're going to want another one. <laughs> and then you're going to be sad about that. So, understand that. Um, what's the best option to watch? Where's the best option to watch this? I mean, I don't know. I, if you subscribe on, if you, um, if you subscribe on Twitch, I know there are no ads there. If you sign up to like YouTube subscription, whatever, I know there's no ads there. Facebook, I don't know if they have ads on Facebook. I don't know where the best place to watch this is. It doesn't really matter to me. All right, going to play a tournament or two, understanding there's a good chance you'll be losing your buy-ins. Yes, a very good chance. <laughs> that is very true because you're only going to be one in seven or so to cash. All right. How do I recommend small, small stakes player study? <sighs> As a well, game you're playing first off, right? Cash games, tournaments, sit and goes, whatever. At a casino, at the home game, etc., etc. And that is important to understand. But really, figure out what the winning players in your games are doing and adjust to take advantage of it. Herdy says, I guess I, I'm ignoring your repetitive question. Uh, for some reason, I have not seen any of your questions, Herdy. Type it in again. Also, we already mentioned I have a hard time following on Instagram because they only show like four little lines of text. Whereas over here, on the um, other channels, they show all the lines of text and I can scroll up and down no problem. World Poker Tour Tournament Champion sounds like a brutal field. It is not. Have you seen the World Poker Tour winner lineup? Is there an incentive to play it? They add $100,000. There's no rake. And they give a lot of other stuff. But it is not particularly a difficult field. Last year, I'm thinking, I think there were three players at my table who were... I mean, look, everyone who is in that tournament is aggressive. But aggressive does not mean good. So you sit back, you lay a lot of traps, you don't do anything ridiculous, and hopefully the chips flow your direction. I... What did I have last year? I think I played it... Has it been three times or two times? I think I played it three times. I know one year I bubbled it. That was unfortunate. Um, I made two pair. Button versus big blind. The flop was like jack eight six. I had jack six suited. My opponent had jack eight. Or maybe it was jack nine six. He had jack nine. One of those two. So that was not fun. That was an unfortunate spot. I know last year I had straight and flush draw. Ten high straight and flush draw against Noah Shorts, who had... I think he just had aces. He always has aces. Maybe he had a set. Um, so I lost that, that big pot. Um, so, whatever, right? <laughs> um, but it's a good tournament. One of the best places to stay in Vegas for the World Series. Jason, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Are you trying to save money? Are you trying to have the most convenience? Are you trying to stay in a fancy place? As you see, Jason, there are more answers to these questions than... There are more questions to your question than there are answers. Let's see... Is the variance of a 27-person tournament similar to a single-table tournament or a multi-table tournament? Frank, it depends on how many players are in the multi-table tournament. If it's 1,000, then obviously it's closer to 9. If it's 40, it's obviously closer to 40. Right? How many days are you taking off during the series? I'm taking off a full three weeks in the middle. And while I'm there, I'm taking no days off. You notice that I have a folder on special ranges. Can I comment on them? I don't think I have a folder on special ranges. Where was it? On my desktop or something? I don't even know. We have all sorts of fun stuff. I do have a um, poker to study folder where I have all sorts of fun stuff. All right. Is there anything else to talk about in terms of finding value? Really, you just want to ask what are you actually trying to accomplish? Right? And a lot of people just don't. A lot of people do not think about that. They just go and they mindlessly play. Fast dealers versus slow dealers. Well, it depends on if you're good or bad, right? If you're bad, you want to play as few hands as possible. 
If you're good, you want to play as many hands as possible because you make money every single time you are dealt a hand. You make some amount of money per hand that you are dealt, so that's it. Is long ball poker good for tournaments? The idea of long ball versus small ball is ridiculous, in my opinion. You need to, instead, learn to play fundamentally sound. And if you learn to play fundamentally sound, then sometimes you're playing big pots and sometimes you're not. But you will find good, solid GTO poker is relatively tight and passive with the medium strength hands, which is often what you will have. And it is bonkers aggressive with the best hands, which is what you have some small portion of the time, and the draws, which is also what you have some small portion of the time. Skyscanner.com. I've never heard of it, but maybe they have good deals. Will the drawing be live tomorrow? Mm, I don't know. Maybe, I sh maybe it should be. Uh, I'll ask my team and try to figure that out. What time will it be? I have no clue. Do you need to worry about balancing your range when playing against the 50 hands you play against someone in a tournament? Um, no. Depends on how good they are. But um, no, I would definitely say you probably don't. Unless they're very good. If they're very good, then yes, you definitely do. So if they're bad, you just want to do whatever makes the most money with your individual hand. That said, I mean, if you find yourself with a bluff, like an obvious bluff, should you make the obvious bluff? Well, it definitely fits in with being balanced, right? You're bluffing because it provides balance. And um, if you're not worried about that, what's that mean? You just stop bluffing? Well, that would be terrible, right? So you want to make the play that leads to the highest expected value. And quite often, a balanced strategy does lead to that. That said, if you just look and tell your opponent's going to fold, bluff with everything. If you look and tell your opponent's going to call, value bet them to death, right? How's Amy liking her new job? She has, actually hasn't started yet. She starts in... A week, two weeks, I think. Maybe a week and a half, something like that. She's currently wrapping up her old job. Quite often, whenever you leave any sort of job that's a, that's a high-level job, you often have to spend some time transitioning your work over, winding down, etc., etc. So that is what she's doing. If you know someone's playing GTO and they think you're playing GTO but you aren't, what's the best way to take advantage of them? You can't. If they're playing GTO, it doesn't matter what you do. That's the fun thing about GTO, is if you play perfect GTO and your opponents don't, you're going to crush them. Well, they're going to crush themselves, right? Your opponents are, whatever they do is going to make them lose money. Do I try to avoid the lucky player? No, I try to play with the lucky player because the ranges are too wide. You want to play against players who have ranges that are too wide because they're really easy to play against. Oh, goodness. Here's our little coffee book. You think this is enough for a book yet? I could probably write at least a page about each one of these. I wonder how many this is. These are all the topics we've discussed chronological order, starting in the back. Um, we have to figure out something to do with this whenever I have some free time. You know, believe it or not, guys, I currently have... Let's see, how many book projects do I have lined up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven book... Counting, not counting this one, we have eight, eight ideas that are all good ideas lining up. And, um, eight's a lot. <laughs> so, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to this little coffee book. I might have a thousand, a thousand um, options to go through. You know, it's actually funny. When I first started this, I didn't really take very good notes. I just wrote, like, one line. Then I quickly realized, oh, my God, if I'm writing a book, I sure better outline this a little bit better. So I have to go back and watch all of these. So that'll be fun. We'll get to that one day. Is a 27 person single good practice for tournament bubble slash final tables? It absolutely is. Um, and I, that's how a lot of the best players in the world got very good. By playing sit and goes, not necessarily 27 person ones, but by playing sit and goes and understanding payout implications. It's very important to understand payout implications because they're very important. I actually had a blog post a while back where um, I wrote about, I don't know, it was like a $100,000 blunder or something. Someone made it the World Series of Poker final table. Where either they didn't push right or they called wrong or something. And it was because the World Series of Poker has a funny, or had a funny payout structure where something like 11th place, or no, 10th place was like 600K, 9th place was a million, 8th place was something like 1.1 million. So you see a ridiculous payout jump, right? 100K difference between 8th and 9th, 3 or 400K between 9th and 10th. And if you don't understand the implications of that, you'll spew a lot of money all over the place. Oh, let's see. Think about getting back. Should you start with or try yourself? Should you give yourself a 100K bankroll? 
what should you... I'm not sure what you're asking, Jason. If you have 100K now, what should you do? You should just play within your bankroll, right? Be smart. How, when you play... Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking here. Should you be more aggressive or passive in satellites? It depends on where you are. This idea of I need to be tight in satellites doesn't make sense, and the idea you need to be aggressive doesn't necessarily make sense. It depends a lot on the situation. So winner-take-all game, well, understand it's a winner-take-all game. Just play perfect chip EV poker, right? If it's a multi-table satellite, realize you're trying to get in the top 10%. Sometimes that means being really aggressive. Like, say you're on a bubble, and one guy has, let's say you have 20 big blinds, other guy has 18 big blinds, there's like four other players who are likely to bubble who have four big blinds. Well, they fold you, in the small blind with eight, 20 big blinds and big blind has 18, you just get to go online with any two cards and big blind has to fold any two cards, right? You just crush them. Um, there are other spots where let's say you have 10 big blinds and everybody else there has four and the big blind has 18, you should fold everything because you really don't want to risk going broke before the other people. So it's not just a question of aggressive or passive. Is GTO really something you can learn? Absolutely. How do you go about learning it? Practice, is there software? Pile Solver and Munker Solver. They're very in-depth. I would definitely instead suggest you sign up to a poker training site that discusses those things. That's what we discuss at PokerCoaching.com. We try to teach people how to play well. And we do that in a simplified version that is actually implementable. If you just try to study the solvers, you're not going to get very implementable information. It's, it's, it's kind of information, well, super in, in, implementable. Hey, James. You want to come in? Want to come say hello? Are you being a good boy? So anyway, that's, that's what we teach at PokerCoaching.com. What do you have? Uh, oh, what do you have here? Stand up. Are you all sweaty? Yes, Why are you so sweaty? Oh, oh no, what happened? If, if you win the big 50, you can do whatever, whichever tournament you want. Your bankroll's 900 bucks. You can spend 100 on Hold'em Manager 2. No. A lot of sites offer deals where maybe you can get it in some way. But no, I, I would not spend that money on it yet. If you have like 2,000 though, probably. Why don't I play super high roller tournaments? Because the ROIs are very low. I don't want to play high, high buy-in tournaments with a low return on investment. That doesn't make sense. Lower ROIs lead to tons of variance. Do I want to have $5 million swings in my bankroll? No, that would be ridiculous. I have no desire for that. Looks like, hey, did you have fun yesterday? Last yesterday, James and I went to the museum, we went to the park. I actually posted a video of our little, our little museum trip at youtube.com slash float the turn. You can check it out. It's for my Instagram story. So um, that was fun. Can you tell everybody bye-bye? Bye-bye, bye-bye. Can you, can you blow them a kiss? Can you say I love you? I love you. Okay, good. I, I love all of you too. Go on, I see you. Car. Oh, get your car, yeah. Okay. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Bye. That was Mr. James. Okay, let's see. Zeox says, depending on the stakes you play, you can get a cheaper version. Yeah, something like that. Um, the dinosaurs would have scared you. The dinosaurs would have scared. Yeah, dinosaurs, they were scary. They were fun. We do a good job. James is lucky. Yeah. Uh, we do our best. We're, we're, def we're probably above average parents. I don't know how other parents are doing it, but we do our best to be good parents to our children because that's all you really can do, right? I don't think I have much else to say. I already removed the paper. This, this is what we're going to talk about on Wednesday. I have no clue what it is, but that's okay. Um, you know what? Maybe I could pull the drawing on Wednesday morning. Or no, so tomorrow is the 30th. That's the last day for the drawing, I think. So then I could draw, I could pull out on a little coffee. That's smart. We'll do it on coffee. Have I heard of Kelly Criterion? Of course I have. I know almost everything about gambling. A lot of people don't realize this, but um, I try to be an expert in most things that I am directly related to or tangentially related to. Um, poker is definitely a gambling game. So we know all about Kelly Criterion. Is it applicable to poker bankroll? Maybe, maybe not, probably. Well, obviously it is applicable because essentially it tells you what portion of your bankroll you should bet based on your potential edge and the variance in that bet. Um, I think a lot of poker players typically try to keep half of Kelly 
But the problem is, is that it's very difficult to actually um, estimate your return on investment for any poker bet. So you have to be careful using that because a lot of people just estimate wrong. I think a lot of people are, are incredibly specialized and I think it's usually better to at least understand the other the other things that are kind of related to your field of choice. Um, for example, I don't play much mixed games, but I'm editing a mixed game book by Dylan Lind, which will be coming out soon. Lindy? Lind? I don't know how to say his last name. Sorry, Dylan. And it's a great book. And I am smart enough at poker to ask questions, right, when things are not clear and make the book better, right? That's part of the job of the editors to read it and make the book better. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, pertaining to all things gambling. We know how to play blackjack and slot machines and roulette and craps, all in advantage. But we don't because the edges are very low and it's not worth the time. But it's important to know that kind of thing, right? It's actually not that important. It's probably not necessary. But it is important because then you understand how the casinos think, right? Whenever they do stick the poker players in the back corner, a lot of poker players are like, why would you do this to us? Well, it's because it's not all about you, right? Very important to realize it's not all about you. PP for Life says it takes huge samples to get a correct estimation. Not only that, the ROIs change on a regular basis. And also, let's say you're playing tournaments. As a high stakes tournament player like myself, there are going to be some tournaments where I have 150% ROI. Then there are going to be others where I have minus 15% ROI. If I just lump them all together and say out the door we have 30%, That'd be really dumb because then I'd go and play every tournament and I'm just spewing money in the 15% ones, the minus 15% ones, right? So you have to figure out your edge on individual tournaments. And also you have to understand that your edge probably goes down over time because games get tougher over time. They all do. So it's not just as easy as saying, yes, I have X percent ROI across the board. Even when I used to play sit and goes, I would have different win rates based on who was in the game. And that was very, very clear because, you know, if you're sitting with all regs, you're going to lose the rake. You just are. Um, sometimes you don't get to pick who sits. Then that is where you essentially have to just do a random draw. But a long time ago on Party Poker, you actually got to pick the exact seat you wanted to sit in. And some seats had better ROIs than others. And whenever you looked at the table, you had to decide, is this one worth it or should I wait for the next game to load and try to get a better seat, right? So it's not just as easy as... I have 30% ROI, so I need X bankroll. That would, that would lead you to make all sorts of mistakes. I mean, for example, if I thought that I would have, let's say, 30% ROI across the board, but I end up investing just lots and lots of money in the 25Ks and almost no money in 1500s, because there's, you know, if I play an equal, an equal number, I'm actually playing a huge amount of money in the games that are perhaps not good and a lot, very little money in the games that are good. Do you have a card count? One, two, three, four. Five. I can count them. I can count the cards. We already mentioned, we know everything pertaining to gambling. When I say everything, I mean 90, 99.2% of everything pertaining to gambling. Listen, we know all about how to beat all the games. We just mentioned this. And yes, it is thought that maybe you can beat craps, maybe you can beat roulette. It's not easy. It's not, it's not for a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. What's the difference between sit and goes and a tournament? Look at the structure. They're very different. Troy says, thank you for responding to your question. We're always happy to respond to questions. I actually have a list of your questions. If I haven't gotten to it, I may eventually. Some of them I didn't like so much. Um, like, for example, we're not going to do... What is your range in this spot? Because that doesn't work so well for this format. You'll have to go to pokercoaching.com slash inner circle for that. But, um, yeah. Poker says, craps cannot be beaten. Well, that's just fundamentally false. You have to find good casino bonuses. Easiest way to beat all the pit games is to play when they give you bonuses. And they will give you bonuses. Every once in a while. Not a ton, but every once in a while. Um, for example, if they're giving you four times comps and you know that they'll normally give you, I, we're not going to get into it. Do, do the math, right? Do the math and you will see that there are certainly spots where you can very easily crush it. I know Alan Kessler 
one year skipped almost the whole World Series of Poker to go to a different casino, not in Las Vegas, and play video blackjack for the whole summer. And he had, um, claims he had an insane return on investment, or an insane hourly rate. So he skipped the World Series to go play slot machines, video, video blackjack. And people think these things aren't beatable, yet you can have pff, super high ROIs if you're smart about it. Super high hourly rates. Do you ever play games like... No, do I play gambling games just for fun? No, there's always a purpose. But anyway, it's important to understand that the games are not just the straight mathematics of the game with no bonuses. Casinos exist and they give you bonuses and you have to make the most of them. That is your job, is to make the most of them. Don't go too far, though. You might end up in court, <laughs> like some, some advantage players out there. Is there a book to learn GTO? Modern Poker Theory. It'll be out in a few months. How did you get into poker, and how was the transition to an expert player? It's not a transition. It's just a matter of spending a lot of time getting better and better and better. And then you wake up 10 years later, and you're an expert. How did I get into it? I was playing with friends for $1 buy-ins. And um, I was always losing. And I didn't like always losing. So I studied. I spent my time studying, working. And eventually, our skills improved. All right, that's going to be it today. Do you like or just avoid bounty tournaments? I don't care. Bounty tournaments are, they lead to lower return on investments across the board. So be aware of that. that and why is that? That's because bounties are paid out to many people. So imagine 80% of the field gets paid out. Is that a tournament you want to play? Not if you're a good winning player. Winning players want the tournament to be winner take all. So why is that? Because the winning players are going to take first place more than any other spot on average. And clearly you'd rather just take, make it be one or take all them. All right, have a great day. We'll be back on Wednesday. We're going to try to do the drawing then. I'm not sure if we can. I don't even know if it's possible. I don't even know how to do the drawing. There's, I think you just click a button and do it. But I guess I could do that. Oh, you know what? I can't do it. You want to know why? Because I have to confirm that the winners exist. And I don't think, uh, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Will PokerCoaching.com guide you towards being an expert player? Absolutely. That's the whole purpose of it. All right. Have a good day. Enjoy yourselves. If you want to try out PokerCoaching.com, you can get a completely free trial. Um, go to PokerCoaching.com. Sign up seven, for seven days. I suggest you go through the homework challenges. Go all the way to the beginning. Start at the bottom and work your way up. Because the homework challenges kind of build on themselves. And if you start at the newest one, you're probably going to be lost. If you started the oldest one and work your way forward, it'll be a good framework. And, you know, binge it. Cancel after a week. I don't care. I want you all to get as good as you possibly can. All right. Have a great day. Thanks to everyone who is here religiously. Is religiously the right word? Thanks to everyone who is here frequently. We have Louis Philippe. We have um, Yaya. We have Joel. We have Gerald. We have lots and lots and lots of people here. Thank you all very, very much for being here. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. Be nice to someone, and I'll talk to you next time.